Hi and welcome back. In this video, I wanted to address some of the wider questions around fasting as a possible intervention for long COVID. Who might it be appropriate for? Which phenotypes might see benefits? And what level of function or health is required to attempt it? This last question is particularly important, so I do have to urge caution if you want to try it yourself, and please do seek medical advice first. So, let's dive in. The first thing I'd like to say is that no matter what the treatment or intervention, long haulers are not a homogenous group. I've previously talked about two posited phenotypes being labelled as like ME-CFS and not like ME-CFS, but you can slice the cake many, many, many more ways than that. And this isn't just a challenge for us, it's a challenge for all treatment trials of the condition. There's no point trying antivirals on people who don't have viral persistence, or autoimmune drugs on people who don't have autoimmunity. So all trials have to be able to select the treatment group appropriately. But this is really hard when we don't yet have tests for viral persistence, or autoimmunity, or MCAS, or neuroinflammation, or indeed much else. We can just about diagnose POTSI dysautonomia, but not the activity intolerance, heat intolerance, or digestive intolerance that can come with it. And not only can we not test for it, but we don't yet have consensus on what the phenotypes of long COVID might be. In which directions or dimensions do we try to slice the patient group? Do we do it by severity, by the number of symptoms people experience, by the type of symptoms they experience, or by the pathology we think might be causing them? What I'm getting at here is that even if fasting works for me, that doesn't mean it'll work for you. In exactly the same way that my comments are full of people saying that LDN really helped them, but unfortunately it didn't do anything for me. So, how do we work out if fasting might work for you? Well, first of all, I'd refer you back to the first video in this series where I broke down the science and rationale for doing it. Fundamentally, we've got plenty of evidence that fasting is very effective at lowering inflammation. There's a track record of it being effective in dealing with autoimmune conditions. We've got papers suggesting it helps engage the parasympathetic nervous system. And we know that it clearly has an impact on your metabolic system. So even if we discount autophagy, there's quite a few potential mechanisms of action here. If you've got family history of autoimmunity, had A to P before long COVID, or have MCAS symptoms now, there's a good chance the modulating role fasting plays with the immune system might help some of the related symptoms. If you have obvious inflammatory or neuroinflammatory symptoms, then there's a good chance it could help those too. Dysautonomia is a slightly tricky one. As I've said in previous videos, the first few days of extended fasting are rough. As the body shifts into ketosis or fat burning, the nervous system goes a bit haywire. If you're severely dysautonomic, then this haywire uh, reaction can be unsustainable and potentially even dangerous. It's one of the reasons why I wanted medical supervision for my fast. I can't necessarily quantify what the safe level would be to try and do an extended fast if you're suffering with dysautonomia. This is something you'd either have to discuss with your personal or clinic doctor. But in my own experience, once I got through this bumpy phase of huge cortisol relief, I certainly noticed my nervous system calming down. And my dysautonomic symptoms along with it are baiting sufficient even to handle 10 to 15 minutes in a full Finnish sauna, which would have been absolutely unthinkable before. And then we get to the massive subjects of fatigue and PEM, for those who are in the ME-CFS subtype. There's some logic for why fasting can help here. Not only does it reboot the way your body creates energy, but the processes of autophagy and mitophagy could theoretically help resolve mitochondrial issues. So depending on which of these issues you identify might be playing a role in your long COVID, there may or may not be a role that fasting could play for you in recovery. What I would say though is this, we're still unclear on whether there's a persistent trigger in the system, whether that be low level active SARS-CoV-2, residual spike protein, or reactivated latent viruses. If you go with Wirth and Scheibenbogen's recent theory, then this trigger uh, would set off GCPR autoimmunity, which messes up blood flow, oxygen transfer, mitochondrial and autonomic function, creating a self-sustaining doom loop. My personal working theory is that some people have perhaps resolved this persistent trigger that may have been around earlier in their journey, but not necessarily the doom loop that it set off. Others may still have this trigger in their system and the consequential doom loop. That doesn't necessarily mean their symptoms are going to present any differently. 
My personal rationale for fasting was whichever of these two groups I was in, I'd potentially either reboot my whole body and break the doom loop, or potentially intervene and stop the body's reaction to that persistent trigger, if indeed there was one. My logic for this being the recent study that showed that 21% of recovered non-long COVID people still appear to have signs of spike proteins in their biopsies. So that is to say the trigger in itself doesn't have to be a prerequisite to symptoms. But really, the point of fasting isn't to make your symptoms better whilst you do it, it's to fundamentally try and change the rules of the game and potentially lay the groundwork for future recovery. Whether that's going to be the case for me yet or not, I don't know, but I will of course keep the channel updated. So a word on what level of function or sort of level of baseline health is necessary if you want to attempt extended fasting. It's pretty difficult for me to quantify this, but my score on the Bell MECFS scale before going to fast the first time was generally about 45. If you're anywhere around this kind of level, I'd strongly recommend going to a clinic if you wanted to try it. Much lower, and I'd probably say you shouldn't try it at all. The same would apply to those with severe dysautonomia and POTS. But let's say your level of function is a bit higher, and maybe you're the wrong side of the Atlantic for expert fasting clinics. There are plenty of resources available online giving you advice if you wanted to fast at home or in a hideaway somewhere, but my input to that would be to say that I would really recommend taking some medical advice first from someone who ideally knows about fasting and long COVID if you can find such a person, and then some form of supervision, ideally medical, whilst you do the fast itself. It's also worth pointing out that you can also work your way up to an extended fast by trying shorter fasts first. Which brings me on to my next subject. If extended fasting isn't on the menu for you, that doesn't mean that intermittent fasting might not be. If you have a spin through the comment sections of my previous vids in this series, you'll see many long haulers singing its praises. My personal take is that intermittent fasting can help manage MCAS and dysautonomic symptoms by not throwing things at the body that agitate each of these two conditions. I talk about it more in this video, link also in the description. It seems less likely, to me at least, that intermittent fasting would fundamentally change the game, but that doesn't mean I'm right, it won't or can't, and even if it helps a bit, we'll take what we can get, won't we, in this perpetual odyssey of discovery. So I hope you found this brief discussion helpful. Like everything with Long Covid, we have to listen to our bodies and minds and see what resonates for us personally. We're all on our own journeys through this wretched experience and sadly, for the time being at least, we do have to find the answers for ourselves. Look after yourselves, until next time.